So while Dave switches over to his computer, let me just tell you a little bit about the practicalities of today. Uh, all the speakers have 10 minutes to talk in 5 minutes dialogue. During the dialogue, the next speaker will set up. So that way, when you get to the end of your time, I will physically drag you up the stage. So we should be running smoothly. It makes it less stressy. Right? All these wonderful people that I mostly know. And um, yeah, there's, for those of you who don't know, there's coffee and one room over. If you want tea, please get pasta. Uh, Callum just brought some water as well. And um, anything else I should say? Yeah. I think so. All good day. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. I'm very pleased to, to kick us off uh, this morning. Um, so my name is Dave Millard. I'm uh, based here at the University of Southampton. And for around the last 20 years, I've been doing research into hypertext and interactive digital narrative. Um, one of the very first conferences I went to was ACM Hypertext in 1999. Um, and there, uh, Mark Bernstein, who's since become a, a good friend, uh, posed a really interesting question. He said, where are the hypertexts? Um, and what, he, what his point was, really, was saying, well, if hypertext is so great, if it's so marvellous, where are the mass media, popular, million unit selling hypertexts? Right? Why hasn't this taken off? Um, now, Mark had a vested interest. Um, he was, and still is, a publisher of hypertext systems and, uh, and work. Um, but he was kind of really asking this question about hypertext in a, in a literary context. Um, and why not? Right? I mean, we've already mentioned uh, Doug. Uh, we should also mention Ted, I guess. Um, and Ted's book is not called Knowledge Machines, it's called Literary Machines. So where are our literary machines? Um, and I think in the 20 years since, things have changed quite radically. And these literary machines are all around us. Um, and there are the games that we play. Picking up on um, Sometimes that connection is really clear and obvious. Right? So this is um, Inkle's um, 80 Days. Uh, it's a best-selling game from uh, 2014, um, and it's clearly a hypertext. Um, so for a start, it contains something like 750,000 words, that's substantially more than War and Peace, um, and it's a classic Nodalink hypertext. It's a Jules Verne-esque story where you travel around the world and you experience scenes and interactive characters through text, um, and then you make decisions about what happens by clicking on hyperlinks. So I think in some cases it's very clear that these games are hypertexts. In other cases, um, it's slightly different. Uh, so, for example, in The Walking Dead by Telltale, uh, they don't, don't use Lexia in the same way. Here, the story is told through cutscenes, through in-game uh, situations with the, with the engine. Um, however, I would argue that it's still a hypertext. And the reason I would argue that is because the narrative structures you see are exactly the same narrative structures. The challenges that the author faces are exactly the same challenges. In fact, you can take Mark Bernstein's work from 1998, The Patterns of Hypertext, and you can apply it to The Walking Dead. And you can see things like split joins, where uh, the player makes a decision, uh, the story progresses separately for a short <coughs> while, and then it comes back together again. And it does that to help authors manage complexity. So I think when you have non-linear storytelling in games, even when the, the textual element is quite firmly embedded, um, I think you can still argue that you have a hypertext system. Um, other games, it's less obvious. Uh, so this is The Last of Us by Naughty Dog. Uh, you play as, uh, as Joel with Ellie, making your way across post-apocalyptic America. Um, is there any other kind of America? <laughs> um, um, and basically, as you go, um, you experience the story through cinematics. Every player will see the same cinematics. The grand narrative arc is identical. The story will always end the same way for every participant. Um, it still has adds something of value, though. So. Uh, uh, Denny Grigo, who's a, a very, uh, a very uh, well-known curator of hypertext, does some fabulous work <coughs> keeping all the hypertext alive. She talks about the difference between interaction and participation. So I think of that as interaction as being uh, engaged with the story, changing the way that it's going, um, whereas participation, you're, mu uh, you're much more along for the ride. Right? But by being immersed in the story, by experiencing that story, it has a much greater impact on you. Uh, so in movies we say, you know, show, don't tell, and in games we say, play, don't show, basically. Experience the narrative. But even something like The Last of Us has uh, hypertextual elements. They're just quite well hidden. 
So as you explore the world of The Last of Us, you'll encounter people in the environment, and those people will have dialogue. Um, and the system will change the dialogue that it gives you according to the actions you take in the game. So I'll give you an example. Let's say uh, you, and, uh, you and Ellie, you're hiding in a store, and a group of militia break into the store. Right? Well, the dialogue system says there are nine different things that the militia might say, and then it looks at what you're doing. So if you are hiding, perhaps you're out of line of sight, then the system will sculpt away certain elements of dialogue, and it will only choose the ones that make sense when you don't have line of sight. If you were to pop up and take a shot at one of the members of the militia, um, that changes the state of the world, and that changes the dialogue system, and different dialogue options are available. Right? Um, this is a classic sculptural hypertext. So not a no-link system, but a system of rules and conditions where you move by changing the state of the world. Right? Um, it just doesn't look like a hypertext. Uh, you're making diagetic choices, choices in the game world. You're not clicking on links or making menu options. Um, but it's still absolutely a hypertext system. Um, a game like Life is Strange, which I would thoroughly recommend to everybody, by the way, brings together many of these kind of elements. Uh, it's this sort of nostalgic uh, uh, story exploring the relationship between two young women, Max and Chloe. Um, and it brings together both the participatory elements and the interactive elements. And also it does something really well that's another common way of getting story across in games, which it does environmental storytelling. So it does this by having environments associated with characters that you explore to find out more about what motivates them. So this is uh, Chloe's bedroom, um, and it does it through a sort of giving you information both in a multimodal and a multi-channel way. So you can find stuff that's text, that's audio, that's video, and you can find it manifesting in different ways. So the text might be graffiti on the walls, or notes on the desk, or it might be a letter in a drawer. Um, and all of those things help you understand the story and build up a picture of, of what's happening. Um, and if you want to have that full story, it's not enough to just play Life is Strange. Uh, there's a prequel game called Before the Storm, there's a DLC called Farewell. Uh, there are graphic novels that follow that you can see what happens to the character after it's finished. Um, Life is Strange was an episodic game, so it was released as a series of episodes. So there's a whole bunch of work out there which is sort of PR produced by the company around the release of each episode. Um, and there's also an absolute mass of fan content. So there are thousands of Let's Play videos, mainly of people crying. Um, there are character studies talking about what motivates the people within the, the story. And there's reviews and analysis that kind of talk about the themes and explore the alternative endings and what it means um, in this particular story world. Um, there's even blogs by 40-something uh, academics who really should know better, talking about you know, how it uses agency, for example. All of this is a hypertext that surrounds the main experience. <coughs> and to experience Life is Strange fully, I think this is true for the majority of modern games, you really have to experience this whole hypertext. It's very much in the spirit of what Henry Jenkins calls transmedia. Right? Um, and what you're experiencing is no longer necessarily confined to the screen either. So my last example I'm going to talk about is Zombies Run. Now this is a game which you play on a mobile device, uh, but you put the phone in your pocket, you put your earbuds in, and you go out for a run, and you're pursued by ravenous zombies. Right? Um, and what happens, it has something around 200 different missions, and through experiencing those missions and hearing those stories, you learn about the world, you begin to build up this layered understanding about uh, what has caused this zombie apocalypse. So if we go back to Mark's question, where are the hypertexts? <coughs> uh, Mark clearly was aware of games in 99, I mean, they were a thing. Um, so uh, uh, what did he think about them? Uh, well, he basically dismissed them as a, as a place for hypertext for two reasons. First of all, that textuality doesn't fit the channel, and secondly, that introspection doesn't fit the channel. Um, and I would argue that these things are no longer true. Right? Because we play on so many different types of devices in so many different ways, because we have this exploding uh, indie scene, our expectations about what games are has changed quite radically. Um, and I suspected that Mark would um, uh, share this view, so I reached out to him. Um, and he basically agreed, he said 11 minutes. Um, so um, he basically said, <coughs> he basically agreed, but pointed out that we still don't have examples of technical and persuasive hypertext. I probably would agree with that. So what does this literary view of uh, text mean for the future of text? Well, I would argue that the future of text is interactive and participatory. It's multimodal, multi-channel, and transmedia. And it's not only beyond the page, it's also off the screen. And it's now. Right? The last 10 years have seen this explosion of uh, incredible interactive narrative experiences. 
Um, and I think we are so caught up in thinking about what hypertext could be that we don't pause to think about what hypertext is. So Mark Bernstein asked us, where are the hypertexts? And I think 20 years later, we know. Right? Here are the hypertexts. They're around us all the time. Hypertext is the mass media of the 21st century. 11 minutes. <laughs> So Life is Strange is, is really a game where you're exploring a relationship. Um, sometimes, uh, depending on your choices, that might turn into a queer romance, for example. Um, even then, I guess there are kind of elements of, of sci-fi <coughs> things to, to spice it up. But there are games where that's certainly not the case. So that Dragon Cancer that I put on the, the board there, that was created by a, a, a guy who, uh, who lost his child to cancer. And it's basically the story of caring for a terminally ill child. So people write these games in order to um, express themselves and express their, their, you know, what's happened to them, um, and also to help other people come to terms to, to, to look at their lives. So there are games which are absolutely kind of you know, escapist, power fantasies, and all the rest of it, and that's fine. But I think these days we've got this very broad spectrum, and there are certainly games that exist which explore these much more serious issues, much more branded issues. Hugh. Uh, thanks, that, that was helpful. I, I, the, the sort of Ian Livingston sort of stuff that you yeah. started with, uh, I always hate that sort of stuff because uh, I think I'm mainly retentive or something, and I, yeah. I worry that I've missed out on bits. Yeah. Uh, and so that's not the way I think of it. And this this does it like that. I mean, do you so, want to comment on the anally retentive sort of people? So I think, I think this is really interesting. So if you look back in the uh, kind of 80s and 90s where people talked about hypertext literature, I think the expectation was you would read and reread and reread, mm. right? Um, almost read to death, you know, and your disengagement with the piece would be when you got bored with it. Basically. And it's interesting if you look at the way that games deal with it that they don't do that. And actually what happens is that that, that transmedia experience, all the stuff around a game becomes incredibly important. Because the first thing you do when you finish one of these things is you go online and find out what other people did, right? And you, you sort of experience the, the story sort of vicariously through them, right? So I think people's experience of games um, uh, is augmented in all of these different ways. And I think that's how many people get around that, that fear of missing out. Right? Um, and sometimes the games are short enough that you can play through them again and again, and sometimes they're, they're you know, 80 hours and there's no way... Probably they're actually better than the uh, yeah. better writing. Thank you, Dave. 